have a confession to make. He said, uh oh, I hate boundary lines. I hate restrictions. I hate anything that tries to confine me to any general singular space. Let's be honest, that's why I hate socks. They're just like elastic cloth restrictions for your toes. Y'all, you know, you just saying about freedom in Christ, y'all need to have like a sock altar time to burn all the, all the socks at the altar, Pastor Melvin. I am not by nature a rule follower. I'm, I'm more of a rule bender. I won't, I won't break the line, but I'll see like how far can I bend it? Can I, can I, can I, can I shape shift it a little bit? Can I push it to one side? When I was uh, growing up, uh, <laughs> the, the timeout spot in, in our house was in the living room. My mom was back there. I don't know why she put a timeout spot in the middle of the living room, but she did. And so in our living room, we would have like the, those old fashioned, like big tube, flat TV things on the stands right there, sitting right there, right? And, 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 and the timeout spot was right next to it by this door. And so when you got put in timeout, you had to sit down by the door in like a particular place. And so here you are sitting by this door, and as long as you were around that space, you were quote-unquote in time out. Well, listen, I figured out as long as something of me was touching that space, I'm going to bend this line. So I'd be, I'd be like finding my way like this. Like, look, look how far I can get. I'm still in time out, I swear. If I got like a towel, I could put a towel in the space. If I'm touching the towel, or the towel touching this space, I can get all the way over here and mess with everybody else. <laughs> Sorry, Ma. Here's the lesson, though, that parent Joel now understands that kid Joel did not want to know is that sometimes boundary lines are for our own good. Sometimes, in fact, boundary lines set you free. They don't actually restrict you. And, and maybe this is the truth of our spirituality. Maybe that my inability to flourish inside of a godly ordained boundary line may have nothing to do with boundary lines and everything to do with my immaturity. Maybe my inability to see that boundary lines are gifts, not evil, is the determining factor of whether or not I can actually taste of his goodness. Because as we will see today in our text, the Lord's goodness is specifically found in the boundary lines that he lays out for us. If you are taking notes today, the today's sermon is called Boundary Lines of Holy Limitations or Holy Boundary Lines. You see, we are walking through a seven-week sermon series on the goodness of God here through this season of Lent. And that's really what Lent is about. Lent drives this sentiment that there is a boundary line, there is a place where flourishing happens. And, and through a period of weeks where we recenter our hearts and go through some purpose reflection, we see where maybe my heart and life has gotten outside of the boundary line and through God's goodness and his grace, he pulls me back inside of the boundary line that is his son and is the character and nature of him. Right? That's what goodness does. Goodness finds us where we are. Goodness finds you when you are outside of your boundary, of his boundary line. And goodness also tells you what you are currently doing isn't as good as it is in him. And his goodness comes, puts a massive steak inside of your mouth and pulls you, say, in, in that steak tastes better than the pig slop you eaten outside of my boundary line. His goodness leads us to repentance. His goodness draws us not just to him, but to the boundary lines that he lays out for us. In fact, you sing it today, freedom in Christ, freedom, free, right? All that stuff. Well, the boundary line is Christ himself. Those who are in Christ are set free. So even in the things that we talk about, about singing and dancing and running and shouting, doing all the things about freedom, there's a boundary line there. It's him. And when we're in him, we have freedom. And when we're not in him, as we looked at last week, every place that's not in him incurs wounds upon our hearts and souls because flourishing happens in his life. I believe this truth, however, 
that goodness has to be experienced. If goodness is strictly a mental assent to something, it isn't really good. Now, there are times our souls, even in light of all kinds of stuff, have to say you are good and you do good. But goodness, apart from experience, is just mental assent and silliness. What does the psalmist say? Taste and see that the Lord is good. Not taste and think and say that he's good. Taste and see. Taste and uncover. Taste and dwell in. Taste and have an understanding in your mind, heart, soul, and body, relationships, and all the areas that he is good. And I believe what the Lord has for us over these next seven weeks or six weeks really is a fresh tasting of his goodness because it's a real thing. Turn to somebody and say, I'm ready for it. Well, if you have your Lent goodness approved Bibles, pull them out. That's the kind with paper and leather. The rest of you will be up on the screen. Psalms chapter 16. Now, last week, we, uh, we're, we're doing a, 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 we, we looked at the first half of this text. This week, we look at the second half. Psalm 16, David is writing. We'll read these uh, 11 verses, and then we'll pull, the, pull it apart. Verse 1, preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good thing apart from you. As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. The sorrows or the wounds of those who chase after and pursue other gods shall multiply. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. David is saying, I will not identify with the pursuit of any other thing outside of my God. Verse 5, the Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. For you, speaking of God, hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. Verse 7, I bless the Lord who gives me counsel in the night. And here, and also my heart instructs me. Verse 8, I have set the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, nor let your Holy One, prophetically speaking of Jesus, see corruption. For you make known to me the path of life. And in your presence, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures evermore. The first boundary line that we see that David unpacks for us here is the boundary line of a holy inheritance. We have a God who loves to give blessings to his kids. We have a God that desires to give you the blank check and let you run through whatever candy store, whatever game store, whatever Nike store you want to get and pick out as many Blazers and Air Jordans as you want to get for your closet. I'm 11 and a half, by the way, in case you want to, want to pay it forward. We have a God that longs to bless his kids with good things. And the blessings that we have from God are not just spiritual. They are also physical. Now, are they primary spiritual? Yes. David, we talked about this last week. David unpacks through the first three, th four verses here, the element of the, of the spiritual blessings of his goodness that are strictly in his presence. But he, he moves us to this next place where this, where the spiritual blessings of God also touch our hearts and our lives and the physical blessings of God. If you don't have a heavenly father that wants to give good gifts, I'm going to suggest you don't have the right God of the Bible. Our heavenly father is one who loves to lavish his kids with things. James 1.7 says, every good and perfect gift comes from the father of lights solomon writing in proverbs would say this the blessing of god makes one rich and he adds no sorrow to it now we're not talking about blab it and grab it and name it and claim it that is poor theology that has no place in this church nor in your life but that doesn't mean we reject the premise that we have a god that expressively shows his goodness and the boundary lines and the things of our life. This is what David says in verse 5 and 6. Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. 
You make my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places, and surely I have a delightful or pleasant inheritance. This word boundary line that David uses here is referencing a plot of land or property that was given to him by God. Imagine something bigger than just the plot of land that you may own. He's actually talking about the inheritance that God gave Israel back before they took Canaan land. In David's time frame, the two things you needed to procure your generations after safety was kids and lots of them and land to put them on. If you got landed kids, the generations from generations to generations to generations would would be sustained in their place. It's on that land you'd have your livestock. On that land you'd build your property, your houses. On that land you'd have your family grow. On that land you'd grow your crops. On that land your genetic line would remain and live for generations to come. And David says here, not just do I have a plot of land, not just have you, have you given something to me, and not just is it a delightful inheritance, but he says here they've fallen to me. And he's using a word in reference to the divine allotment that God said, I see you, David, and I'm giving you this space because I like you. You know, the number of times I've seen, had to counsel through, pray through people, who do not have a view that God's goodness comes from a good father is astronomical. Understanding him as a father who gives things to his kids is paramount to receiving his son and receiving his spirit, who, by the way, both came from a good father. When we lack in our ability to see God's blessing coming from him, a good father, and make it only spiritual, I think we miss his goodness. I think we miss the fullness we could have in him. And in part, we miss giving him the ultimate glory that he's a God that gives goodness in all kinds of measures. But David here in this text, he pulls what Dr. Umidi calls a Jehovah Sneaky. He... He isn't talking about people with land. He's actually talking about people without land. Go back to verse 3 for a moment. For I say of the holy people, he's speaking of the priests who are in the land. Do you know that at the time of Israel, as Israel is coming into Canaan, there are 12 sons, right, 12 tribes. God divinely gives 11 of them property says, all right, we're going to divide up all this land, and 11 of you get everything. One of you don't. You get nothing. That's the Levites. That's who he references here in verse 3, the Levites. What were the, Le- what were the Levites given? The presence of God. Only their tribe would be the ones who fostered the temple. Only their, only their tribe would be the ones who receive the, the, the 10% of the tithe of these other 11 tribes that would sustain them. Only they would be given access to the Holy of Holies. Only they would be given the place of utmost honor and place. But you know what? In order to get that, they couldn't have any property. What I think David is driving at, he's driving at this. Contentment is the gateway into God, into goodness. He's saying, look, I, I know you who have no property, you who have no land, you who have nothing to then give to your offspring like all the other 11 tribes do. You have a divine allotment and you call that delightful inheritance. Sometimes I think it's our discontentment with the blessings that we have been given that lead us to miss his goodness. We cannot taste of his goodness and speak of discontentment from our mouths at the same time. His goodness is never understood solely in physical things. And the moment that we make discontentment our aim, 
The moment we make the things of this land our aim, the house, the car, the degrees after your last name, the corner office, the pursuit of whatever it is, the moment that becomes our primary aim and we become discontented with what he has given us, we miss the fullness of his goodness. Look at what Timothy would say in scripture. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we had food and clothing, we will be content with that. For those who want to get rich, those who want to pursue money and material things as their primary aim, that's what he's referencing, fall into temptation and a trap, and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Our discontentment for the home, the things that we have, are a small step towards a trap, missing out on his goodness. Some years ago, we, for me here, 20 years ago, we started some ministry stuff, and we would have these meetings, right? Now, look around in your room. Is there, a, in the room, is there an empty chair near somebody? If you got an empty chair that you can see, raise your hand. Okay, everybody's hand. If you are at home and there's an empty seat on your couch, raise your hand, please. Now listen, every pastor wants every seat full in the meeting that they have. If they're telling you different, they're lying to you. Every, we all want everybody to be there. And what happened is, is we'd have these meetings and, and, and there'd be a fraction or an amount more than I'd want to see empty chairs in the room that we're trying to do ministry to. And I would come home, I'd be talking to Avery, I'd be so frustrated, not at the people who were there, but at the people who weren't there. My dad, who's sitting in the back, was a pastor for 44 years, said to me one time, he said, son, stop wasting your time preaching to empty chairs. Nothing comes out of ministering to an empty cushion. So unto the people who are there. See the fruit of those who have come. Be content with them. And then see what God does. And my discontentment with ministry and people in the room was leading me to miss God's goodness in the, in the beginning ministry stages of my life. And I had to reframe the, my thinking about what I was given. How do you know if you're dealing with, 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 with contentment issues? When's the last time all you did is said, God, thank you for what you gave me? Thank you for the house. It ain't the biggest on the block. It, ain't, it, it, it doesn't have the best stuff, but thank you for it. Thank you for the car that I'm driving. It works and it runs. Amen to that. Thank you for the degree that I do have. Thank you for the job that I do have. Thank you for the relationships that I do have. It's amazing how the thankfulness kills and pops the discontentment balloon. Do you live in a constant state of comparison? When you're rolling up to the street, to the corner, you're looking around like, man, I wish I had that car. Or, I'm glad I'm not driving that one, though. <laughs> up or down, it has an issue. Has there been somebody in your business, somebody in your department that has a victory that you can't celebrate? They got the promotion you wanted? Or when's the last time you generously gave something to someone that was a relatively prized possession for you? You see, all of these contentment places lead us to tasting of God's goodness. Where do you need afresh to say your boundary line of contentment is the place that I taste your goodness? And I'm not looking over there to see what they got constantly, and I miss what I have right now. The second boundary line that we see in this text that I find interestingly hidden in it, it struck me quite uh, profoundly this week, was I don't just need a boundary line of contentment. I need a boundary line of myself. I have, it's amazing how often I have to be reminded that I am not the preeminent one 
who's required to taste God's goodness. If me tasting of God's goodness is completely dependent upon me tasting God's goodness, I'm in trouble. If it's all about me staying in the restriction of his ethics, of his life, then I'm in trouble. Because I am not that good. Turn to somebody right and say, you ain't that good. Now, some of y'all spouses said that with too much stank on it. You're going to have to talk about that at home. You aren't that good to keep yourself in the boundary lines to get taste his goodness. Listen, it wasn't you that tracked you down. You were in the you were in the pigsty outside of his home, and his goodness found you where you were. And it was his goodness that put the steak inside of your mouth that is better than these corn cobs in this slop. And it was his goodness that pulled you back into his presence. All you did was chew and swallow. Come on. We, 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 we place ourselves on too high of an importance in tasting of God's goodness. And we have to remember it's his work in us to taste his goodness. David here in verse 8 and 9 says this, I keep my eyes always on the Lord and with him at my right hand, we'll come back to this, I will not be shaken. Therefore, because my eyes are on him and because he's at my right hand, therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices and my body will rest secure. Rest in what? That I don't got to do the work. That it's not up to me. I'm not the one that came to heaven who was, who was God. I'm not the one that went to a cross. I'm not the one who raised from the dead. I'm not the one who called me by my name when I was out wilding out. I'm not him. He's the one that called me out, and he's the one that saved me. He's the one that restored me, and he's the one that gives me his goodness. Not you. All you did is respond. Look at what David says here. Number one, he says, I'm keeping my eyes upon him. David is simply saying, this is my sole desire. Mirror Psalms 27, verse 4. One thing I desire, I want to gaze and behold. He's talking about his heart's attempt to walk this out right. That's all that he wants. You give him your desire to get there, and he's the one that gets us to the finish line. And then he says this. And he, speaking of God, is at my right hand. Now, I don't know. It could be in there. But I don't know of anywhere else in Scripture that God is the one who's placed at the human's right hand. Normally, we always see we are at his right hand. In fact, David gets us back there in verse 11, and he says, And at your right hand are pleasures evermore. Jesus sitting at the right hand of the Father, right? Like, Like, we always see God... God sitting on the throne and we are at the right hand. But David here says, no, 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 no. You're at my right hand. You know, you know what it made me think of? It made me think of, of, of the prophet Samuel that says this. It says of Samuel in scripture that God would not let a single word that Samuel spoke fall. What's implied here is not that Samuel prophesied right every single time. It's that, it's that I think it was that Samuel desired so much in his soul to, to keep his eyes on him, so much to, to, to walk in alignment with him that even when Samuel prophesied something that maybe wasn't what God in- initially intended, he said, I'm going to uphold Samuel's words and I'm going to make sure it happens even if I didn't want initially to say it. David here says, I'm not shaken because you are at my right hand and you know I'm trying to walk, you know I'm trying to move forward and you are going to make sure I'm not shaken and I'm resting in your work in me, not my work in me. And this is, this is Lent's message, that he does the work in us. That he says, I know you're out of bounds, bring it back in. David would say this a different way. I love this. In Psalms 23, David speaks of his goodness. He says, surely goodness and mercy follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now, you can only understand Psalms 23 through the lens of a shepherd and a sheep and a sheep's life. Now, I'm going to ruin this verse for some of you because some of you all like this. You probably got a tattooed somewhere on your body. I'm sorry. I'm going to ruin it for you. Here you go. Do you know that sheep have the most nutrient-dense poop of any animal? It's true. 
It's also true you can say poop in church. It's okay. And, and some shepherds write that there would be fields that were completely ungrowable. And they would let for a year or two sheep roam and poop on the fields. And their poop was so nutrient rich, so fertilizing capacity that it would turn that field into something that was ungrowable into a place they could have mass harvest in. David here is saying, catch this now. He's saying, I got some poop. And it's nasty. But you turn it into goodness. You take what was my jacked up self. You take what was my mistake when I was 15. You take what was my mistake last night. You take what was with that email that I shouldn't have sent. You take that thing that I shouldn't have done the other week. And, and when I repent and bring it back to you, you take what is stinky poop and turn it to fertilizer that a later a harvest would grow. And look at what he says here, that this poop thing that turns into goodness follows me, comes behind me, and he says, I still dwell in the house of God. My mistake does not keep me from his presence. You got to put a boundary line around you. And this is what Lent says. Bring your poop, bring your poop-stained garments, bring your mistakes, bring all your stuff, bring it to the goodness of God. Let him give you his righteous garments and let you walk in him. Christus Victor gained the victory over everything, and that includes you and your failures. Where have you defined God's goodness by your own measures? Where have you defined God's goodness by your ability to be good? Where do you need to pop the pride balloon and say, I got some jacked up stuff? I've depended too much on me. What does Paul say to the Galatians? Why are you trying to start something in the flesh, finish something in the flesh? You started in the spirit. It is not do not touch, do not taste, do not this by your own attempt. It is the work of the spirit in us. Can you admit that you need help to walk this out and bring it to him? Put a boundary on yourself. This third and last boundary line that we see in this text, I find so important and pivotal. David in this psalm moves us, I think, to a a real issue that so many of us face. How do we understand and deal with God's goodness in this hand when evil and hardship happen all around us? I'm aware that many of us in this room, you've had phone calls at 2 a.m. that broke everything. I'm aware you've had doctor's reports that just don't seem to go right. You've come home and you've had letters on a, on a refrigerator or the counter that said, I can't handle it, it's over. You've had prodigals go silent and be gone. You've had injustices happen to you and in whatever form or fashion. How do we understand his goodness in light of incredible injustice and hardship? And David was a man who was well acquainted with this. David had his own child die. He had his own sin issues. He failed miserably in his leadership of Israel on multiple occasions. And yet he understands God's goodness in light of evil. Often in the book of Psalms, David wrestles with how is it that you are good while evil men prosper? And yet goodness still, he would say, is experienced. Look at what he does here in verse 10 and 11 as he finishes this. He says, for you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead or Sheol, nor will you let your faithful one, speaking of Jesus, we'll come back to this, see decay or see corruption. And he shifts, and you will make known to me your path of life, and you will fill me with joy in your presence, eternal pleasures at your right hand. Here's what I see happening here. And here's what I think can bring some space in our own hearts and lives. David David didn't have the full picture. He didn't fully understand about Jesus and the Messiah. 
Not, but, but what we do know is he knew that what, is he, what he was experiencing in the now was not the full story. We don't know how God, we don't know how he knew that God would fulfill the ultimate promise of one coming from him in his line. But we know that David knew that what he was experiencing now, the pain, the hardship, the denial, the betrayal of his own son trying to take his kingdom, the, 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 the multiple things that lined up in David's life, that was not the full story. And even though incredible hardships and pain and evil and hard things take place, there was yet another day and another age that everything would be made right in. He says in the text, verse 10, you're not going to leave me to the realm of the dead. What's he implying? I'm going to die. The evils of this land, the sin that ultimately causes death in all of our bodies, it's going to touch me. And in some way, in some capacity, I will taste the sting of death. But, but there's another one who would come. There's another one who would transcend this age from another age meet me where I am in my hell and make sure I don't stay there he would not see corruption he would not see this oh great death where is your sting moment he would transform it all and make all that is wrong right These phone calls, these letters, these things that touch our lives, there are so many why questions that come with it. And you know, if we're honest, the answers to the why are pretty few and far between. And to be honest, I don't know if we had the answers to the why, if it helped anyway. And when I look at Scripture, I really don't see Scripture giving us answers to the whys of the evils. I don't see God unpacking in the Psalms or other places why all this stuff happens. But I see two clear answers time and time again, and David hits on both of them here. The first is this. When the evil comes, when the heartache is present, when the darkest night is present, I am with you. You are not alone. I'm in the tears I'm in the silence, I'm in the betrayal, I'm in the denial, I'm in, I'm in the bad report, I'm in the loss of the job, I'm in the things, I'm there, I'm with you. I'm at the funeral with you, I'm at the wake with you, I, I'm in all the things with you, I'm here with you. But the second answer speaks just as loud. He says, but the story's not you might be in a chapter of pain needing comfort, but there's another chapter coming that speaks of great victory where everything wrong is made right. And in that land, that's where I'm coming from. Dr. Chandler, who is a elder at our church and a scholar, she writes about the history of the black church in terms of spirituality spiritual formation, and she writes uh, an article specifically that targets the Negro spirituals. And one of the things she says in her article, she says, when you look at the content of many of the Negro spirituals, it was always, and the context was immense pain, incredible inequality, and injustice present. And yet these men and women and kids enslaved for hundreds of years would sing songs of another age when all the injustices were made right that were currently wrong. It always was pushing to another age, another place where the stuff we're experiencing right now, the pain, the heartache, and the this causes me to catch eyes on a different playing field, to see a different reality. And if I can sing of that, I can have hope now. But what she writes is she says, for those enslaved, the story of Jesus and the cross said that he was, he was a partner, a sojourner with them in their pain, in their sorrow, in their grief, in their mourning, in their lament, that he was with them in their enslavement. This compassionate high priest who was touched on every regard, Hebrews chapter 12, 
or four. He would be with you. He would be near you. But the one who is, the one who has come, is not just a sojourner in pain, but he's the high king of heaven. He has a face that's brighter than a thousand suns. He comes from an age that needs no sun because his glory fills the land. And the one coming to be with you in your pain and bring comfort now is the one that would make it right in the next age too. And ultimately, that is where his goodness is fully understood. Where the, all the whys of our questions, of our pain and heartache, is fully restored. As we finish here in this moment, I'd like us to do this, if you would. At home, if you would mark on the feet so we can pray for you. If you're in the room, and you'd say, I got one or many of these why questions. I got things of job and family and like not just troubles. I mean, we all got them. But you've had some really dark stuff. You've had some betrayals and denials. You've had some of those phone calls, some losses that you are just struggling to see the goodness of God in. I believe the Lord today wants to put that initial down deposit of him being with you where you are in a fresh measure right now. If that would be you, if you'd be willing to, would you just stand right up to your feet, right where you are? We'll not embarrass you. We just want to pray that you would sense God's goodness where you are. Yeah, who else? Who else in the room? Come on. Yeah. He's with you. He's with you. He's in it. Anybody else? Five more seconds. Anybody else? Yeah, come on, anybody else? You're still popping up. Come on. This is your moment. If you would, right where you are, open your hands. It's a big gift from your dad. If there's somebody sitting around you, just put your hand on their back if they're comfortable. Father in heaven, I ask that you'd come. These, your children, confessing their need to say, I know you're good, but I need to taste it afresh. I need this one who would come from the other age to be with me now. Spirit of God, I pray, come. Fill their hearts, their minds, their souls with incredible comfort. A comfort that nothing of this world can offer, that heals and touches their souls and minds. Comfort by your spirit that ministers grace and mercy to them, that from their own admission, they would say, yes, it's dark, and yes, it's hard, but from their lips, they would declare, you are good and you do good. And the testimony of their lives would be that I have one who is with me that brings comfort and will make right what is wrong. Lord, I pray, make it so in them. In your name, we pray. 